Okay, here we go. So I've shared with all of you a Rhino file. The Rhino file I basically set up so that we can start going through some of the basic operations. It's not all of the operations that Rhino is capable of. There's thousands of them. This is just going to show you some of the basic ones and get you uh, a basic understanding of how to use them and what the options are. It's up to you to explore what other operations are, um, are available to you in Rhino. So you can go ahead and start exploring some of that this week, since we do have seven days before we show up again to, to class. Okay, so if you go ahead and open up the Rhino file, the first thing you might see is actually something like, like this, or, or maybe it's a little bit zoomed out, depending on how I save this file. If, if you look like this and you're looking at the full screen, go ahead and double click on perspective up here. That's gonna pull you out of the full screen. It's gonna show you the four, four views. So right away, whenever you open a new file in Rhino, you're gonna get four views. Perspective, front, top, and then a right. You can change those, um, but if you wanna go ahead and jump into one of those views, full screen like I did earlier, you just double click on the name. At the bottom, you can also toggle through. So if I wanna to go to the top view, I just click on top. Front view, this is, this is really zoomed in. Um, so I'll go into the next one, which is zooming in and out, panning and orbiting. Uh, if you go back to your perspective view, your middle mouse, if you scroll it, it's gonna zoom you in and out. Okay, if you right click and hold, hold that, you can orbit around. If you hold shift while you do that, that's orbit, or sorry, that's pan. If you hold control and scroll, I know some of you have heard this already from me this morning. You scroll, this is gonna give you a smoother zoom. This is helpful for when you guys are inside of your, your buildings or inside of your objects and you're trying to get a particular view. Uh, the scroll is gonna, is gonna jump through. If you click the control, right click and, and, and move that either up or down, it's gonna smooth, smoothly run through the zoom. Okay. So if you guys are able now to uh, maneuver this, the first thing that we're gonna go over are the basic elements in Rhino. There's four basic elements, actually there's five, um, but it starts off with points, which I have here. Lines, which are known as curves. You have surfaces and solids. The fifth one is a mesh, which is essentially the same thing, but not really. Uh, we can talk about that later on in the semester. Two points make a line. An extruded line makes a surface. An extruded surface makes a solid. Yeah, that's what that means. You can also make a polyline. So I'm just gonna walk you guys through on the side here. You have your, your layers palette. If you look, if you look like this, um, I'm gonna try to set you guys up so that you have your properties as well. Okay, so if you're opening it up for the first time, you're gonna see layers and properties on this on the side. What I'd like for you to do is grab your properties, grab and hold and peel it off so that your properties panel is on the side and floating by itself. The next thing you're gonna do is bring it back, but wait until the purple box goes all the way to the bottom. Once it's there, just drop it in. Pull this back up. My layers is gone again. Hey Daniel, do you know where the layer panel went? Yeah, no, that's not it. 
I should have just pulled out here. I also can't bring this up. Okay, so I don't know what happened. That's that's never happened before. But I'm gonna go ahead and fix this. I'm gonna pull all these off because I don't I don't want three three uh, panels basically. So I have my properties. I'm gonna drag my layers. You can watch how I do this. I'm just gonna drag it and put it up at, at the top. So I have my layers above my properties. It's good that I have mistakes like this because when you run into them, now you know how to fix them. I'm just gonna grab all of this and put it over with the with my layers. <clears throat> it's not gonna let me. Okay. Okay. Hopefully you caught that. If not, it it was recorded. And I don't want this right now. Whatever. Okay, so you have your layers. There are already preloaded layers on here. Rhino does not come like this. It's, it's like this because I gave you the file with the layers already on there. So you can add layers, you can delete layers, you can change layers for the objects. Um, we're not gonna go over that, but, but I just wanted to show you that you can navigate through this. You have your options to turn on and off objects by layers. You can also lock them. So if I click on this and I wanna know what layer is on, I can click on it. This properties panel, if you have it open, it's gonna tell you it's in the default. So if I wanna lock that, since I'm currently in default, I can't lock it. I'm gonna get out, lock that, and now I can't select it anymore. I can also turn it off so it disappears. Okay, um, window selection, cross selection, and click select. There's three different ways of selecting objects. You can actually click it the way I just did, and then you can do what's called a window selection. Window selection is you click, drag to the right. The entire object has to be within the box that you make in order to select it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to select that by pulling, putting that into the box. And any object completely inside gets selected. If it's not completely inside, so I'm going to grab like half of these, it's only going to grab the ones that were completely inside that window. That's, that's when I click and I drag to the right. When I drag to the left, this is a called a cross selection. Anything that touches this box, anything that crosses the line is gonna be selected. So now I don't have to go over the whole thing. I just go partly over it and it selects it. I just made a copy, a duplicate over the object. If I click select this, it's going to give me options because it knows that there's multiple objects there. Um, a quick way, because you guys are all pretty much brand new, what happens a lot is we have duplicate objects. So I just want to show you how to correct that or how to delete it. Um, you can go up to edit. So actually, first of all, everybody copy the box on top of the box. So what you do is select the box, type in copy. You can hit enter or space, it's the same thing. I'm gonna go from the corner. If you can't select the corner, let me show you how to do that real quick. You're gonna, you're gonna need your object snaps at the bottom. At the bottom you have object snaps. If this isn't on, you're not actually touching things at the end or at the center or the middle or things like that. So we want this on all the time. And you should have your end if you wanna select the end, which is what we're gonna do. So once you have that selected down here, which is checked already, I'm just gonna click on that same corner. I hit enter and I get out of the command. I have now three of the same objects on top of each other. That's considered a duplicate. So now I can go up, edit at the top, select objects, duplicate objects, it's going to automatically select those two that are on top of each other. I can hit delete and get rid of it.
Okay, we're, we're going to be going through some of these commands, but I'm going to show you first some of the command options whenever you go into uh, any of the features that Rhino has. So let's go ahead and make a new box. Next to the existing box, you can click all the way to the left is a box command. At the very top of the command line, it's going to give you some options. This is basically different ways to build a box. The default is that you first click, that gives you the first corner. When you click again, that gives you the base of the box. The third click is going to give you the height. I can either go up or down. I have the box. Um, so I'm, I'm realizing that I'm on a, already a, a setup computer. If your boxes don't look, oh, they, they, you guys are already set up. You guys can change your views by right clicking up on the top left of the view. You can go ahead and toggle through different views for your scene. So if I go to wireframe, wow, Daniel, you got white. Um, you got a white background. Um, okay, so you go to wireframe. Now this box is, is just the edges. I go to shaded and it shades everything out. Ghosted is pretty good. It lets you see through the object in case you have things inside, which usually you, you will. We'll just go back to shaded. You can, you can explore that on your own. There's different views. Um, that render, by the way, that is not a render. That's just a render view. You want to render, you have to actually render. We're not going to go over that, but I'm going to make sure you guys don't get confused. Um, okay, one of, the, one of the first things that you're going to do whenever you open up a Rhino file is check your units. So I'm going to show you how to do that. The, the way to do that is you type in units. Pretty much everything in Rhino, you can type it in. If you're in Rhino 6, you look exactly the way I do. If you're on a Mac, it might look a little bit different. Regardless, you can see the model units. So we're working in inches. And you can change this. If you do change this and you already have objects in here, it's going to change the scale of the object. So again, I'll let you guys explore that. Um, at the bottom, you have your distance display. Basically, whenever you, you request for Rhino to give you the distance of an object, an existing object, this is where you can determine how it's going to give it to you, either in decimals, fractions, or feet and inches. I like feet and inches because that's the way I'm inputting the information. Um, also, typically, and, and, and now that I have you guys here, because I've been telling this to my students, in every office that I've worked at, uh, in my experience, we're working in inches. Uh, sorry, you're, you're abroad. So that might not be relevant to you, huh? OK, well, in my experience, it's, it's always been inches. Have you been working at offices here that work in anything else? No? I work in meters, but yeah, yeah. when I go, I work on inches. OK, so it, it, it's, in my experience, it's pretty standard. We work in inches. So if you're going to, so you can, you can go ahead and hit OK. And real quick, what we'll do is we'll make a line. So you're going to go to the line command, click. And what you can do is just type 6. You don't click again, just hit enter, 6, enter. That's a 6-inch line. Since we're working in inches, 6, enter gives you a 6-inch line. If I want a 6-foot line, I do the apostrophe. So I type 6, enter, and that gives me 6 feet. That line's now longer. Does that make sense? If I want 6 foot 10, I type it in. Now it's a six foot ten line. Okay. In case your your rhino isn't set up to use gumball, if you go ahead and at the bottom, you're gonna see a gumball option. 
if it's turned off, you won't see the arrows that, that I have here. If you turn it on, now you can actually toggle through moving an object. If I click, if I click the object, this comes up, the gumball. The red is going to move it in the X. The green is going to move this in the Y. The red is going to move, uh, sorry, the blue is going to move it in the Z. I can also move this in one uh, or one dimension. So it's in the both X, Y or the X, Z or Y, Z. And you can also rotate. Again, you guys can explore that. Okay, at the very bottom, you also have, uh, with the rest of the, the panel options, you have uh, Grid Snap, which allows you to click based on your grid spacing. I never use it, but if you'd like to, that's an option. Um, you can also turn on ortho. I usually work with ortho on. And all that means is if you look up on the screen, I'm going to go into the line command. If I try to make a line, it's going to make it orthogonal. 90 degrees are my options. If I want to go free, I can, I can click and hold shift. And now I can make a line that actually has an angle. If I want to go back to ortho, I let go of shift. And now, as you can see, I'm staying orthogonal. So I can toggle in and out of that by clicking and holding shift. You can set that in your settings. You, anything that you want to do, you can pretty much do. If you can think of it, it's already, it's already there. Um, basically, with questions like that, since we don't have a whole lot of time, um, Google it. It someone's already asked it, so you can just Google it. Okay, so um, there are mani manipulation elements with each object. As I mentioned, you have these are your object elements: your point, your curves, your surfaces, and your solids. Within that. You have your control points, which that's a point. I, here's a control point. When I click this line, I get two points on each end. If I want to change that, I can just window select that point, and I can move the line. You also have edges. These are going to be edges. This is not an edge because it's not on the surface. This is an edge because it's attached to a surface. You also have faces, which this is the face. It has four edges. And then the solid has six, has six faces. OK. We're going we're gonna to jump into some of these uh, commands, which I'm going to show you guys. Um, If you go to the next one, control points, one, two, three, four, five, six, there are six lines. They're all identical and we can, we can change them even though we act, they actually don't look different. And as you guys develop your projects, you'll see why that's important. Um, when you click on that line, it already has a certain amount of uh, control points. And what we're going to do, this is what I'd like for you guys to do, is to change the amount of control points. There's different ways you can do that. Once I click into this, with Rhino 6, it automatically gives me my control points. If it's not giving it to you, so if I click all of these, it's not going to give it to me. What I can do is go over to the, to the uh, left side here, where it says Curve Edit Points. If I click that, it now shows me all the points. And if I deselect, those points are still there. Those are just points that make the line. So I'm going to show you guys two different ways of doing this. One is I can go in and individually delete the points.
Another way is I can select a line and I can type in rebuild. Rebuild is a good tool, especially when you have a complex line and you want to simplify it or you want to, want to make it more complex and add more, um, more control points. This panel right here is telling me that in parentheses, there are already existing components. The, the white box is going to give me the options to change that. So if I want to add, if I want to make this with three points, the point count is here. It's telling me that there's 11. I'm going to change this to three. The degree doesn't matter because it not, doesn't have a turn. So I can leave it at three since that's what it is. I'll hit OK. It looks exactly the same as the first one, but they're not just in, in terms of the amount of control points. You see that? I can also go in the opposite direction. Even though this has five, we're going to ignore this. I'm going to do rebuild. Ah. You have to type things right in order for it to work. Okay. So I can go crazy and I can just say 100 points. There you go. So I have, a, I have a line with 100 points. It looks exactly the same. So I'm going to select this. I'm going to click the edit points so that the points show. Okay, and if you look up, up here, you can actually manipulate this line. So I'm gonna take the control point and I'm just gonna move it. And you can see that I'm, I'm getting a curvature here. You guys see that? Okay. So you guys can use this file to explore this stuff. I'm going to continue running through. Actually, let's let's do some of the some of the very 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 basic operations. Move, copy, rotate and scale. You can scale three different ways. Scale 1D, scale 2D and a regular scale, which is the same as a 3D. So, if you guys go back to your box, you can type move. A shortcut to move is M space. So you hit your base point and now you can move it wherever you'd like. You can also copy. So type, you click it, type in copy. I'm supposed to do this at the beginning. Mess up the order here. So copy. I can rotate this, type rotate. It's going to ask me for the base point. Again, as you're working through these operations, if you don't know why, what, why it's doing what it's doing, just read at the top what the question is. Usually it's asking you or telling you to do something. So center of rotation access, this corner. Angle of rotation, point, first point. This doesn't actually really matter, but let's say I wanted to rotate this angle from starting from, let's say, this point. And I wanted it to be true to this. I can just snap to that edge. And now this, this line actually will end perfectly at that corner. That's how I can do that. Another way to quickly rotate, you can click with the gumball. When I learned Rhino, by the way, it was Rhino 4. Gumball didn't exist. This is like, to me, this is kind of new. Um, but with this gumball option, I can click on these arcs as well. And that's going to be... Um, a way to quickly rotate something. So the blue is going to be in the X, Y. I click the red, it's going to be in, in, I guess, X, Z. So I'll show you just the blue. I'm going to click it, and I can actually manually input how many degrees I want to rotate this. So I'll say 33 degrees. You can do, you can rotate in the positive direction, negative direction, and the, that sends it the other way. And then scale. So I'll select the object. 
type scale. I'll start from this corner. It's going to ask for the base point and then the reference point. So again, if I want to if I want to make this proportionate to something else, I can use it as a reference. I can also just type in two. It's going to make it twice as big. Ten, ten times as big. So I'm just going to do this to click to so give you guys a visual of how you can do that. Scale 1D does it in one dimension. So I'm going to type in scale. I'm going to click 1D, select the object, the base, reference, and now I can extend this. 2D does it in two directions, and I'm going to let you guys explore that. If you go back to the this original set, and if you select this line, I'll show you the extrude command. You can do this to any curve. So you can select this, type in extrude. This is already set. It's, it's doing it in both directions. There's options up here. You can say both sides, no. Now it only does it in one direction. OK, I can make. I can make this curve that I changed into a surface as well. Cool. So let's try some of the fun stuff. There's a sweep and loft. So again, this is basically just to show you how the operations work. Now, how did I make, how did I get those little curved turns on the edges? Okay, so I'm going to type sweep. You guys can type sweep with me. With me, uh, You have two different sweeps, sweep one, sweep two. Sweep one means it's one, one line, which they call a rail. Sweep two means there's two rails. So you can actually sweep and, and manipulate something uh, depending on two curvatures. Okay, we're going to do sweep one. Enter. Select rail. This is going to be the rail. Click that. Then it's going to ask you for the cross. Since it's only going to, it's going to do sweep one. As soon as you click it, you can't click another rail. So it's going to go straight into the next question, which is select the cross section. That's where I'm going to click this little box. Once I'm done, I hit enter. This is, this is actually important. You're not going to tell the difference right now because it's symmetrical, but the, the direction actually does do something. If you just click it, it'll change the direction. Click that cross and it'll change the direction. You can click and drag this around as well. This will make a difference later on. Right now, you just need to know that it exists. So I'm going to click it there. I'm going to hit enter, and now it's going to create that surface. Again, you have different options, freeform, road-like. OK, so I'm going to do one. You guys can do the other ones. You can. You can, ex you can explore. Right, there's no like rule to it needs to be free form or road. You're gonna get different different results. So actually a good one that I think. Oh, I thought I had it here. Oh yeah, I do have it here. Okay, great. So to answer your question, you can figure that out right here. If you go to this this one that has a spiral, this is actually a section that looks like a ramp. So I'm gonna do sweep one, select the rail. Select the cross, hit enter. If you look at it, you can't really drive on that. And basically what's happening is that this is following, this is following the curvature, the direction of the line. If you wanna if you wanna hold and fix the cross section, what you do is you put road like and it flattens it out. So it maintains this section. No matter where you cut this thing. You're going to get that section. The other way, this thing will start to rotate as you went up. 
So again, there's no right or wrong, but if you're doing a, if you're trying to do a ramp um, and you want to make sure it's ADA and people aren't going to, you know, fly off and you're going to sweep this thing um, and you need it to be flat, you want to make sure you have road light. Okay, if you want to, this is just a side note, if you want to get back into the command that you just finished, just hit enter again. You don't have to type it in again. So if I did sweep and I want to sweep something else, I just hit enter and it'll repeat the last command. Just to show you guys that, this is again, just an example you can look up top. I just went down here and I selected sphere. If you click and hold, a lot of these have multiple options. So I'm gonna go to sphere. And I made one. I just hit enter, enter. So I don't have to keep going over to the edge and find the, that command. Okay, I got excited. Okay, the other command that I'll show you is loft. You can loft between multiple objects. You can loft between just two objects. The where you click and the order in which you click is important. Um, you can you can also just do a. Unless you guys know that I'm 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 not right I'm incorrect, you should be able to just select this, and locked and it'll do it. It'll know, it'll it'll somehow select in order. Yeah. So if you, if you do the window select across select, if you just click. If you click in that order, um, it'll do it. But if I click here and then start jumping around, it'll mess up the order. Let's see if I'm right. I'm going to click the edge here, then the middle. I'm going to fly around. Yeah, so this thing went back. So it, Rhino remembers the order in which you selected the lines that you want to loft. Loft basically means it's going to try to connect curves using a surface. So what you can do to practice this is just select the whole thing, type in loft. Again, there are options. Is there a right one? The right one is the one you choose. But you can flip through it. So you can see now what we created is a curvature. Loose is going to make it a little different. Tight is, is going to make it tighter to the curve that you use to, to generate that surface. All right, cool. You guys are modeling. Great. Let's toggle over to the top view. So at the bottom, I'm going to just click top. And we're going to do the offset command. So if you zoom into this offset area, there are, there are curves, there are surfaces. These are these two are surfaces. You can't tell from here, but they are. And so we're going to do offset curve. So if you type in offset, enter, it's basically going to generate another curve off of the existing curve, a consistent distance from that curve. That's what that means. I don't know if that was clear, but. When you see it, you'll understand. So I typed in offset. The distance is one. I'm just going to click this line, and it's going to give me a preview of where that offset is. This is how you can make thicknesses on walls, on floors. And we'll do that three-dimensionally with the surfaces. So if I click again, now I have that, I have that second line. If you notice. It's a red line originally, now it's a white. That's because I'm on a new layer. I'm currently in that layer. So this check mark means that I'm in that layer and that's where I'm modeling. So anything, any operation that I make um, in Rhino is gonna 
add that, that element in that layer. If I wanted to change it, I can select it. Let's say I want to do layer one. I can right click here, change object layer. I just changed the layer. I can do the same thing if you guys want. I gave you this file so you guys have already something to play with. So offset, and I can repeat this over. Until I can't get further than an inch. Same thing with this curve. Okay, cool. Let's go back to perspective. I want to show you guys how to zoom. And uh, there's different ways that you can zoom on top of the, the scroll. You can zoom select. You can zoom extend. Zoom select means that it'll, it'll zoom to the things that you have selected. Zoom extend means it'll zoom. It'll show you everything that you have in Rhino that's showing. So if I wanted to zoom into this area and I didn't want to scroll there, I can window select all this. At the top, I have a magnifying glass with two circles. Let's go ahead and click that. It'll take me straight to it. Okay, the reason why I'm asking you to do that is because now there's surfaces. We can do the same thing. There's, a, there's, a, there's an additional step with the, the surfaces which is if you type in offset, the last one here is surface. It's going to ask me, it's asking me to select the surface. I'm going to click it, enter. You see arrows on it. The, if you click on the surface, it'll change the direction. That's the direction of the offset. So there, I added thickness to it. So that's a consistent one inch thickness on that surface. I can do the same thing to a closed object or a solid. So if you look at if you're looking at this, go ahead and go to go to your um, your options for how you view this and go to ghosted. You should be able to. See, be able to see through this. Go ahead and do offset now. Again, offset. I just want to offset curve, which isn't going to, it's not going to work. If you try to offset a surface using offset curve, it's not going to work. So offset surface. I'll click it, enter. The arrows are pointing outward. If I wanted to go inward, I just click it, it'll go in. I hit enter again because it's going to go it's going to go in one inch. So now I have an inner surface and that's exactly one inch away from the outer surface. So no matter where you cut this, you're going you're going to get a one inch thickness. Okay, next command, section. I was going to leave this to the end, but, but I'm, going to want to, I'm going to do this now. Let's go to the top view. Now, I can, like, whisper into this mic. It's wild. Okay, so if you, if you go to the top view and zoom in onto this, this uh, cylinder, what I want you to do is type in section. Enter. It's going to ask you to select the object you want to make a section of. Select it. Enter. Now this is your chance to make a section. And we're not going to be super precise now, um, but I just want to show you that I can make a line at the top by click, click. That just made a section through that object. I can also do multiple sections. Again, if I hold shift, now I can do this at an angle because I was an ortho. Click, click. Now I have two sections. I'm still in the section command, right? At the top, you can see start of section. I'm going to hit enter again to get out of it. If I 
drag this red arrow, I can pull it off. I'm going to go back to perspective. Zoom selected. Another way, by the way, I'm, I'm way out here. I can just do zoom, Z, enter, S, enter. It'll take me straight to it. Actually, I just noticed it only did the section of the outer. That's done. Okay, let's do this again. So I only selected the outside object. So I'm gonna I'm gonna cross select. So I'm gonna make sure I get both section. I'm just gonna do one this time. So there you go. I got the inside and outside. What you can also do if you go to your front view, remember how we were zoomed in as something random? Let's see what happens here. Okay, great. Let's work, let's go through this because this is going to be helpful. So I just zoom selected into that section and I'm completely uh, focused on that cylinder, but there are a lot of things in the way, right? What I can do is I can just go back to this. I'm going to go back to this perspective, but I'm going to double click. So I can see both views at the same time, or all four. I'm going to select everything that I want to see. And what I can do is, this little light bulb that's turned off, click and hold. This is a really useful command for me. I'm sure it'll be for you as well. So, and then you go down here where you see the light bulb turned off with a yellow and black box on it. That's going to invert, select, and hide everything. So it's just a cylinder. So when I go back to my view here, my front view, now I can see the object without anything interfering. That makes sense? If I want to bring everything back, I'll go back to my perspective. I type in show, and now everything's back. If I want to hide something, let's say I want to hide this box, I can select it, type in hide, it goes away. It didn't get deleted, it just gets hidden. That's a different way of having something disappear than turning off the light bulbs over here. This, this is how you change things by layer. You can also change things by object, which is what, what I'm doing now. Okay, so bring them back, I typed in show. Okay, they're almost just, I think there's like two more operations and then we can, we can wrap it up. Are we at a pretty good pace? Does anyone feel like they're, okay. So con construction planes, also known as a C plane. Um, when you're in perspective, it's, it's the one time that it might get a little bit confusing, but it's also the time where you have the most control over the seaplane. The seaplane, it can be identified by the grid. So when we open up Rhino and you, you guys were looking at the file originally, you should have seen a little, a little grid down here. I can move that. Now, why would I want to move that? If, if I wanted to somehow draw something on the side, on the side of an object, I'm going to need to move the seaplane. There's multiple ways of doing it. Having control with the seaplane is really good. Um, so I want to show you guys how to do that with this irregular object. What is that? I don't know what that is. So I'm going to zoom into this guy. There's, uh, of course, there's different options for the grid. You can change the grid spacing. You can you can change how far the grid goes. I don't really use the grid a lot. Um, I usually create my own grid. Um, but what I'll do is I'm going to show you guys how to move the grid so we can start drawing on this irregular object. So I'm going to show you guys, and if you want, just look at the top here because it's just going to be an example. Okay, I drew a box. 
Yeah, this is my front view of that box. This is what it looks like in perspective. What I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a figure. If I want to close a polyline, I can just, if I know I want to close this, I can just click where I started or I can do C, enter, and it'll close it. Now it's a closed curve. Okay, cool. I made that awesome. I love it. I want to do it again. Or maybe I want to do something similar. I'm going to show you the wrong way of doing this. So let's say I want to copy this or want to do something similar to it. If I start drawing from here, and some of you who have experience know where this is going to go. Okay, they look pretty similar, right? I know I, that doesn't look great, but put too many points. Okay, let's see. How's that? Pretty similar? Who knows where I'm going with this? Okay. Um, so they look exactly the same, but as I rotate, I realize that they're not actually the same. This is this is your C point. So what this means is I'm in perspective mode, but the C plane is flat on the ground. When I change views and I go to my front view, my grid now is standing up. So when I'm in, I'm in a different view, I get a different C plane, construction plane, and now I'm drawing in a different view. So it's important to understand that because it can get really frustrating. And I'm gonna show you how to control that so you don't have to go back to your front view, draw the line and then move things, because I know that can be, that can be frustrating. And so what we'll do is real quick, we're gonna go up to the top here. Let's go to the C planes tab. There's a lot of different ways to move the C plane. One of, to me, one of my favorite ones, which is what we're gonna go over today, is where I just select the Z. So you guys understand there's X, there's Y. It's like half the things are in this space. I have a board, but no uh, marker. Okay, so you have X, Y, and then you have Z. It's okay, it's, it's, it was just a visual, it's, it's fine. Huh? Oh, you don't have it there? I actually don't know, but that's why we that's why we have Daniel and that's why we have Ariana. Uh, so they're looking, yeah. So they're looking for the C plane in Mac. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is different. Okay, so I was saying you have the X, Y, Z. So you know that if you have X, Y, you can automatically determine where Z is, right? So for me, what I do with the C plane is I just determine Z. Once I determine Z, now X, Y is already set. So for me, if I want to make this my C plane, I know that Z has to be in the opposite perpendicular direction to those lines. So I would just select, sorry, I need to slow down here. So this is the set C plane by Z axis. It looks like two dots going in the perpendicular direction of the grid. So I click and I go away from the grid or from the from that drawing. And now I can draw on that. If I if I start drawing that object again, because I moved my C plane, now it's actually now I'm actually drawing on there. Cool. So this is what I want you guys to do. If you did it, great. But I made a three-dimensional object. That's a little bit weird. And what you can do now is you can set the C plane based on the object. 
And when, you, when you're selecting an object, it's going to choose the face. So if you guys go up, if you find this box, go ahead and click it, zoom to it. Get real nice and close. Don't be shy. You go to seaplane, object, bless you. Seaplane. It's gonna be the third, the third option here. So I'm gonna click that. I click on one of the faces, so I'm gonna click on face two. I don't see it and I'm a little concerned. Let's start drawing. Okay, well, it worked, but there's no grid. Okay, well, for me, what's really nice is when you have the grid that shows up, now you know that, the, that you're on that seaplane. I didn't have an indicator, so I just did a quick little test. It, it is there. It did work. I also don't like I keep my grid off because it's just it's to me it's a little distracting. But if it's helpful for you, you can you can keep it. it doesn't make doesn't make a difference. So if you want, just go ahead and toggle through different ways of moving the seaplane. You guys can explore that on your own. But I want to show you that. What I want to show you is that you can actually draw on this object now three-dimensionally, and that's how you would do that. It's, it's manipulating your construction plane. So basically for, for me, the point of this workshop is to give you guys an understanding of the interface and, and uh, how to use some of the operations. I'm not, again, I'm not going to show you all the operations. You guys can explore that on your own. But I want you, you guys to get an understanding and, and have a good understanding of some of the basics. Um, there's also, I'm going to show you another one, which is an explode command. Explode basically takes the individual elements, like I said, a solid object, has like a, a solid cube has six surfaces. So rather than clicking, and only being able to select the cube, I can select the individual surfaces by exploding it. So I don't have a cube here. I have I have some weird um, object. I'm going to click it. I'm going to type in explode. And now when I click it, oh, it looks like it's grouped. So let's ungroup this. Looks like it's double grouped, so we're gonna ungroup it again. This is great because you guys are gonna you guys are gonna run into this. So I exploded it, it, I clicked it, and it was still together. So I I could pretty easily assume that it was grouped. There's a difference between uh, grouping and joining because we can join this back. The difference is that a uh, join is gonna make it a true single object. And it can only do that to objects that are that are touching, or that share an edge. You can't you can't join two objects that don't touch, but you can group them. And the grouping means I can click one, and select everything in that group. So if let's say you wanted to group all your doors, you have 20 doors in the building, you can group those. If you're smart, you would put them in a layer called door, and then select the layer. But let's say if you're running through and you made a mistake. Um, you can also just group them. So you click one and you select all of them. So there is a difference between group and join. So I can go ahead and select that. I can delete it. Now I'm looking inside of it. I'll show you another kind of nice command that I think should work. 
Um, let's let's do this. I'm going to show you another another just way to to select objects. At the top, you go edit, select objects, and I'm going to select curves. The reason why I'm going to do that is because I want to get rid of everything except for the surface. And rather than selecting the surface, this is easier. So I'm going to do select curves. I'm going to type hide, get rid of everything except the surface. Window select or cross select the whole object. Type in join. And then you can, you can do a command called cap. Cap basically, I think it's cap. Oh boy. Let's see what happens here. No, it didn't work. No, no, no. It was no. There's another one. I forget. The one, the one that like open. No, no, no. Yeah, no, but that's not. That's actually not what I was going to try to show. But, but I, but I. No, it's not that either. Okay. Here, look. I'm just going to do this. Um, let's say I accidentally deleted it and I need to close it. This whole thing is exploded. So I'm going to select this whole thing. The only way I'll be able to cap this is if I join it. And um, I should pause this, but real quick question. Do you guys use backface as a, a solid color ever? I like to use it because it shows me what's in and out. Does anybody else use it? Should I show them how to do it? Okay. Okay, perfect. So we're going to do that. So I'm going to show you guys how to go in, into your settings and change that. So everybody should try to follow along. The Mac user is just going to be a little bit different, for sure. Okay, so I'm going to go to settings. I'll type settings. Again, I don't do this a lot, so I, I may stumble a little bit, but you should be able to go to view, display modes. We're going to go to shaded. Keep clicking that arrow down until you get to objects. Okay, just kidding. So keep so what you're gonna do is you're gonna do settings, view, display mode, click on shaded. The options panel to the right, you can scroll down where it says, I just saw it, where it says shading settings. You have back face settings. It's basically right now by default, it's the setting is that the front face is going to be the same color as the back face. And we're going to change that. So what we'll do is we'll click on use front face to use Yeah, sorry, I can't read. Uh, single color. I like to change it to red. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to click this. This is the color right now. I'm going to click that. I'm going to go to red. If you want, you can just do it like an off red. That doesn't look like <laughs> one of the, one of your layers. Hit OK. Hit OK. And when I go to my shaded view now, you guys can see what happened. There's a front face, there's a back face. If you mess up, because you'll be doing Grasshopper, and Grasshopper can sometimes send things in a, in a direction that you don't, under, uh, don't expect, you can, you can flip the face. So just in case your, your objects are reversed, like the way mine is, I can just flip. So type in flip. We don't we don't have a, a good example right now, but I if sometimes your objects can look like this. And you won't know it unless that thing is turned on. However, I think if you select it and type in join, Rhino will automatically choose a side for you. Yeah. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Bad teacher. But, okay, so anyways, you guys have the recording. You can see what I clicked, where I clicked, and how I clicked it. Okay, so so before I wasn't able to tell that clearly that this was open because it was the same color. Now I can tell clearly that the top is missing. So I can select this and type in cap, and it'll cap it for me. It'll give me back that, that surface. If I explode it, which is probably where you are, I'm going to explode this again. I can get rid of, let's say, this little, this little triangle piece. So I exploded it, selected that. If I select this whole thing and do cap, you're going to be like, why doesn't it work? Why doesn't it work? It's not joined. It's not joined. It's not going to do it. So if I click one, that's my indicator that this thing is actually not joined. It's also true that if I join half of it, I don't know what's going to happen here. I do cap. Yeah, it's not going to cap it. Yeah, cool. All right, great. Everybody got that? On to the next. What's up? Oh, sure, if it's not planar. Okay, so planar means truly flat. You can't cap something that's not truly flat. You have, you, have, you have to uh, either manually cap it somehow. You can lock between. I mean, there's so many ways you can you can do it. There's all there's always a way. Google. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna show you. A, I'm gonna show you a few more. I'm gonna show you a few more things so you guys can um, practice this over the week. This last part here is make 2D. Rhino, Rhino has the ability to create a drawing out of your objects. This is, this is like I mentioned at the beginning. I think I mentioned at the beginning. Um, at the offices that I worked at, we developed full sets from our 3D models. And the way we would do that is we would make 2D of our objects. So if we wanted to draw a section, we would 3D model the building, we cut a section through it, which I showed you earlier. I could also make 2D of an elevation of a top view to get a roof plan, to get a site plan, to get a floor plan, same thing. So what I'm gonna show you is just real quick how easy this is um, to make a drawing out of your object. So if you go over to this make 2D section, Go ahead and zoom into it. There's, there's going to be a couple things that I want to show you within this, um, just so that you have a lot more control over your drawings and you can go back and make corrections and not feel like you have to start over, possibly. So there's a way to set a view, which is the same thing as saving a view. So if I really like this view, I can save it and then I can always go back to it if I start panning around or orbiting around or jumping around this, the file. So what I'll do is I'll right click. I'll go to set view. And I can go to name views dot dot dot. It's going to open up a little panel again. It's going to be, I think, slightly different for the Mac users. Um, if you're running into issues and we don't have time to fix them now, you can go to your studio professor or just pick, like, find me later or find someone else later and, and we'll help you out. You go to name views, you click on save as, which is, this is the view that we're in. I'm going to save it. It's going to go to default perspective. Let's just call, let's just call this view one. I'm going to hit OK. It saved the snapshot of it. I can close this now. And if you notice at the very top left, this changed to view one. 
So what happens? I'm going to continue going around and taking a look and making sure everything's beautiful and it's perfect. But I want that view back. I can't get back to that view. Well, you can. You go set view and you find that name view, view one, and it drops me right back in. This is, this is extremely helpful when you guys have multiple um, drawing types. So for example, if you're going to do a render, this is what I like about V-Ray. Uh, if you're going to do a render and you want to put line drawings on top of it, you can do that right from here. And I would set the view, save it. So in the future, if you decide to change the material or you decide to move the opening, a window opening, you, have, you, you don't have to worry about going back and Photoshopping certain things. It, everything will fall right back into place. Um, there's one other thing that I want to show you too, which is if you right click and you go to I was on the right button. Viewport properties. Actually, it's already set over here uh, to the right. There's different ways that you can view this. You can do a perspective, a two-point perspective and a parallel. You guys can imagine what a two-point perspective is going to be. Um, parallel is, is basically going to give you um, true verticals on your surfaces. So I'll show you the difference. If you guys look up at the top, of the screen here. The difference is this is a true vertical line. But from this view, you can tell when I bring this over to this edge, it's not actually true vertical, right? Even it doesn't look true vertical, even though it is. The way to fix that is you go to your parallel. And now you can see it's true, it's truly vertical. So if you want to do an isometric or an axonometric drawing, that's how you would do that. Just set the view to parallel. Okay, so let's do an axo. Let's do a true vertical for, for this drawing. Yeah, yeah, of course. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. Yeah, no, that's that's a really good point. Yeah. So when again, I, I like to always refer to how how does how, what value does this have when you leave school, and when you're looking at at, at work or you're de developing work for clients, and they're going like, hmm, I want a four foot window, and then they change their mind to a six foot window, and then they want to change the mullions and change the colors, and they want to see how it looks with a with a I don't know with a glass door next to it. Um, it's really nice if you can just flip through something that just just changes the elements that you're changing and not the view with the elements because it's hard to compare. So in that aspect, it's it's extremely useful to be able to just set your view um, in this way. And you're trying to eyeball it; it's going to be a waste of time. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so you can go back to that. But since we went back to this, it's important to know that. Even though I was in I was in parallel, so if you look at the top here, I was in parallel. I'm gonna go back to that view. So set view view one. It's gonna shoot me back to perspective because I saved that view as a perspective. So even though I went parallel and then view one, I'm not in parallel anymore. So you can go to your you go to your view one that you saved, then go to parallel. I would save this if that's what you wanted. For this exercise, we're not going to do that. Go ahead and select the object and then make 2D. You're going to have options. Rhino can give you, if it's just the view, it's going to be a drawing of the view that you have right now. So if you're in the front view, it'll give you a front view elevation um, drawing. If you're in perspective, which is what we're in now, it's going to give you the three-dimensional drawing of it. You can also do 
what they're calling third angle projection. It's the same thing as first angle projection, just in a different order. So it doesn't matter third or first, it's the same thing. Unless the order really matters to you, then it's not. Okay, so the other thing to, to keep note here, I like to keep um, the source layers checked. And that's just gonna give me more control of my drawing when I export this to Illustrator later on. So if you guys are being organized with all of your objects, you guys are putting them in different layers. When you make 2D and have this checked, it's going to make 2D and it's going to subcategorize everything based on its layer. So when you bring it to Illustrator, now you have full control of all your lines. We're going to we're going to check hidden line so that we can see what's beyond. And you can group or ungroup the output. It's a little annoying when you bring it to Illustrator and everything's grouped, because then you have to ungroup it. So I uncheck this. It's up to you guys. And then down here, it's going to ask you, what layer do you want this in? The only value this thing has is if, you, if you're making 2D and you want to have an insane amount of layers. Um, usually, I just keep this as make 2D, and that's it. So I'll, do, I'll hit OK. It's going to process what you're looking at. And once it's done, what you can do is go to your top view. So I'm going to top view. I'm looking, I'm looking at what's not my drawing. So to quickly jump to it, I'm just going to do the magnifying glass with this. Or I can do zoom, Z, enter, S, enter. And it's going to shoot me to that. Now, there's other stuff on there, so I'm just going to move it out of the way. Oh, and, and, and great. So here's another reason why um, you have to be careful with the seaplane. My seaplane, I moved it. And so now I'm not truly orthogonal to my view when I'm looking at my gumball. So in order to do that, which I, I wanted to show you how to do that. Um, in order to do that, you would go back to your seaplane tab. And then I'm going to go down to the seaplane with the arrow pointing down. That's your world seaplane. I had a student last semester, you know who you are, who was trying to export stuff. And it wasn't showing up in Illustrator because the seaplane was really, really far. Um, if, you, if you just hit world, it'll send it back and you can see where it truly is. So... Okay, I had to do it again because when I did it the first time, the seaplane was was off. So I just I just control Z and I made 2D again. Now that my seaplane was back to world, so now I can just go ahead and grab the, the green, drag it over, and I have now a made 2D of this object. Um, I'm also going to show you guys uh, maybe maybe a couple couple more things here. The background, and I'm going to change Daniel. I'm going to change your background here. For a sec. What you can do is go back again to your settings. You should already be in display mode, display mode shaded. If you click on that in your background, it's saying to use application settings. We're going to do solid color. I'm going to click on this. Do not, do not use any of these colors. If you're going to try to use a darker gray, this is not the one to use because most likely you'll make your layers one of these colors. And when you draw a line of that same color, it's not going to show up. The line is going to be the same color as your background. You're going to draw a line and it's going to disappear. But it's not that it's not there. It's just that you can't see it. So my suggestion is to scroll all the way down. You can see the comparison down here. I'm okay with that. I hit okay. Now I can see my drawing a little bit clearer. Was everybody able to make 2D? Was, there, was anybody not able to make 2D? 
Did you get stuck or is your computer going to crash? It doesn't look like this. Okay, well, um, while they try to resolve that, I'm, I'm basically looking at a top view, a perspective, and two elevations off of one make 2D. That makes sense? Okay. The, just, I guess, just to point this out, Rhino understands that there's an edge in the back. And so when we were selecting maintain source layers and show hidden, that's what this is. This is this is a hidden line, and it's making it a different color. So this line doesn't exist in the front; it exists in the back of the surface. So anything that shows up in the back is going to show up as hidden. If I had another object in here, by the way, and it was hidden, and it was a different layer than this object, it would actually show up in two different layers. And again, you want that control when you bring it to Illustrator. Um, you, maybe you want a different dash type for something, and that's that's where you'll be able to control that is through your layers. So I, I encourage my students to have uh, always good layer management. Um, just be aware that when you guys are in a rush, if you're not organizing your 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 drawing or your project into layers, uh, it's going to get more complicated. And you start exporting and making drawings and using Photoshop and all that stuff. Okay, and then um, this this is going to be the last thing. At the very very top of Rhino, you have your uh, menu options. I mentioned at the very beginning that there there are curves. <laughs> There are surfaces, there are solids, there's mesh, right? Okay, this is all starting to make more sense, the interface. You also have dimensions. This is where you can annotate things. Annotate is where you, you add notes. You can show dimensions, you can show angles, uh, you can show a radius. You can, you can note things or annotate things that way. So really quick, what I just want you guys to be able to learn how to do is to, for example, show a dimension of something. So I can dimension this and it's going to tell me what the distance is. You can customize this and I'll show you where and let you guys explore this. So it's dimension tab, annotate styles. That's That one is based on default automatically. I can make a new one by going here and calling it, let's call it Usually when we export, it's to a scale. So I can say eighth inch scale. So I can go here, I can, I'm just gonna show you real quick. I got out of that, I just, I saved it. I'm gonna change this over to a different one. It's set to default, I'm gonna change it to a eighth inch scale. So now, now that I'm in the uh, properties for that, I can go to edit. And I can change the height. Let's say that's too big. So I just change the size of the text. This is where you can go ahead and tweak your drawing. And I do recommend um, as you guys are getting close to uh, publishing your work or printing your work, do a test print to see how big your your uh, your text is, because you don't want <coughs> big fat markers, or you don't want something super small that you can't read. So always do a test print. And you can also let's see. Yeah. Uh, you can change the units, so I can go to 
feet and inches. Hit apply. Now it's going to tell me it's eight and a half inches. Sorry, say it again. Well, no, because you're all you're all, you're you're in a building, and you're drawing a door that's three feet, and it's fitting in your screen. Yeah, I'm. There's a way to calculate it for sure. Um, we're just, I'm just not going to go through what that calculation is, but you guys can explore that. Um, it's it's a lot of this is going to be you guys sitting down and actually going through trial and error. This didn't work. This is too big. You know, and always, of course, getting guidance from your professors who will say, yeah, that's pretty clear or that's too big. Yeah, so I can I can show that. So let's so I just did the the perspective, which you guys can see, by the way, that this isn't truly vertical. So keep that in mind, um, but I'm just going to go here. <clears throat> By the way, since these are orthographic, this is going to be a true dimension to what that object is. So I'll go to dimension, annotation styles, actually. So there's a there's a way to set the annotation style current. Since there's two, there's a default, and I just created an eighth inch. I want to make sure that I'm annotating an eighth inch. So in order to do that, I went to dimension, set current. Okay. Might be a little bit different for Mac. Again, you guys can ask that later. And what I'll do now is do a linear dimension. So that's one foot, six inches. And and yeah, as Fabiana was saying, I can go ahead and I can modify all of this. I can modify the spacing between this. I can modify the extension of this line. I can modify the scale and even the type of arrow that I want. This is an arrow, even though it's, I think it'll it'll turn into a tick. So what I'll do is I'll go here, default, or eighth inch, and I'll click on edit. And this is where I'm gonna go to arrows, and I can change this to a tick. And I can make it, let's exaggerate it so that we can see it. Let's make it twice as big. You see that? So you have full control over that. Um, I, I will suggest this though, real quick, that if you're going to be annotating, again, I'm, I'm in layer one. This is, this is uh, sloppy. I'm being sloppy. This should be dimensions, layer. And I, this is where I, what I want to recommend. So I just changed it to the dimension layer. Always dimension in black. Why? When you bring it to Illustrator, which I'm assuming a lot of you will, if you bring it in red, you won't be able to change the full um, the full object. So if you change if you change it in Illustrator from red to black, you're going to get an outline around your arrow, and you won't be able to change it except if you go one by one, and you don't want to do that, and you don't want you also, unless unless maybe you want to have a colored um, annotation, I wouldn't do that. So I usually just sit it on a black layer and I make sure that it looks black in Rhino. So when I export it, it's always black. Okay. I don't know what time it is. Two forty. Okay. Any questions? No, we're good. Okay, cool. This this will be available uh, on our D drive.